Good morning. It's great to get together around the Bible and especially into the book of Micah. I look forward to seeing you guys face to face soon, I hope, and pray. But for the moment, I have done the unusual thing of sending out the text I'd like read because Micah is an unfamiliar book and I'm ashamed to say it's unfamiliar to me as well. So I've concentrated on the major books, but everything is God's word in the Bible and we ought to get to know it. So I've made a commitment that I'm going to work personally through the minor prophets, only a few of whom I know. Now Micah comes to us and here's the message. The Lord is coming. What shall we then do? How shall we live? It's a big question. Micah is full of good news, more than any other prophet I can find, percentage-wise. Forty percent is good news. That's quite a bit. The great thing, the best thing, is that the good news centers on the news that God was going to send his shepherd king, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the light of the coming king, how were the people to live and what was God going to do? Why did he need to send the king? And of course, you and I live waiting for his return, the return of the king. So it's a very interesting letter. It's a summary. He preached for between 35 and 50 years. That's a long time. And God is so kindly condensed it for us into just seven chapters. We're going to look only at chapter one today. Will you pray with me? Our God and Father, we thank you so much for the Bible, this great treasure, and pray that you'll help us understand it and believe it and live out the implications thereof to your praise, to our growth and for our good witness. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Because Micah's unfamiliar territory, I sent out the request to read it. I really would like you to have your Bible open in front of you now. Because being unfamiliar, what I'm going to do is walk us through the text. The intro is chapter 1 verse 1. The word of the Lord comes to Micah. During the reign of three kings of Judah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Jotham and Ahaz were godly kings. Ahaz was one of the worst, most evil kings in Judah, ever. And his impact, like an evil politician, there are hangovers even into the next generation because evil Leaders impact followers, and followers carry on even when the new leaders come. They carry on the old way. It takes a long time. And what happens here then is these three are mentioned. It gives us an idea of the time frame. And then he tells us that God gave him the vision of all of this. So he saw it in full technicolor. And we're going to see how it affected him. Because we want to say, first of all, the text says, Listen, the Lord's coming. Verse 2. Hear, O peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth and all who are in it, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you. This is to the whole world. The Lord from his holy temple. Verse 3, first line. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. Now in the Bible, you know, God came a number of times, visited Adam and Eve before sin entered the garden. He visited them afterwards. He visited Abraham before. He judged Sodom and Gomorrah. He came as the angel of the Lord. Um, he came through the prophets bringing his word. But when, and of, and of course, uh, God is omnipresent. He is all present. There's no escaping God's presence. So when the Bible talks about coming, 
it has in mind a special event. Not just the fact that God is near. I mean, as Christians, the Spirit of God indwells us. And in the Bible, there are three, three great comings. First coming, Christ. Uh, Micah 5 talks about the verse where it said that uh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you might, are least among the, t the towns of Judah, out of you will rise one, will come one. His origins are from of old, and he will shepherd my people Israel. And of course, the, the shepherd king, the coming of the shepherd king. That is the first great coming in the scriptures. And it's the one you and I think of. But the second coming is literally the shepherd king's second coming. Not in frailty and weakness, but in glory and power and victory. He will come to reward his people and he will come to judge. Must be clear on this, folks. Uh, Two Thessalonians, the apostle Paul makes it very clear. And when the Lord comes, chapter 1, verse 6, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you, the Christians in Thessalonica, and give relief to you who are troubled. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels, punishing those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. And the majesty of his power. There is a day of judgment. It is at the second coming of Christ. It's also a day of reward for God's people. Both of which should make you and I pay very careful attention. Because the third element of coming, the first two links specifically to Christ's coming, first and second time. But the third one is the one mentioned here. Verse 3, Micah 1. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. Note how it describes him. He comes down and treads the high places of the earth. He treads them. The high places were seen by the pagans as contact points for the gods. So they'd, they'd have their worship places on top of hills. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire. It's useless. <laughs> wax before a fire. <laughs> Splot. No defense there. No, nobody buys wax walls. Like water rushing down a slope. You can't stop it. Coming towards you going to take everything. And that's the idea here. Now the question is why? And the third use of the coming comes in here, and that is he's coming to judge. And before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the final one, through history, there have been these judgments where God has come and acted in wrath. What does he judge? Well, verse 5 makes it clear. All this is because of Jacob's transgression that he's coming. That's the, the sins of God's people, those who claim to be God's people. They had the scriptures. They had the prophets. They didn't use them. They ignored them. They presumed on God. Let us learn from this. Knowledge is only one thing. It's knowledge acted on by faith in obedience, humble obedience. That is what God looks for. It is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Jacob is used as a picture of the northern kingdom, the Jews split. Judah, Benjamin in the south, ten tribes in the north, immediately they split. They went into idolatry. God judged them. He sent messages. Micah uh, is, I think, the fourth of the minor prophets. Anyway, you can tell me afterwards. Hosea um, is the last word. He's, I think, the first after Daniel. He is the last word God sent specifically to the northern kingdom. 722, what verse 6 and 7 says, happened. The fall of Samaria. 
This period of history is marked by the, the power, the superpower of Assyria. The great kings were Tiglath-Pileser, how's that for a name, and Shalmaneser, Shalmaneser, and then Sennacherib, and Sennacherib conquered Samaria. You may know William Blake's famous poem, The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, the sheen of his spears, etc., etc. That talks about Sennacherib's defeat. He conquered Samaria, flattened it, but he couldn't take Jerusalem. <laughs> Great incident to read. I'm not going to go into it now, but good to read those chapters in Kings and Chronicles. So what happened was, God's people had his word. They turned to idolatry. They said, oh, we're worshipping God. You know, seriously, you know, we're very sincere, but we're just doing it our way. God said, that's not worship of me at all. <laughs> Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place of planting vineyards. I'll pour her stones into the valley, lay bare foundations. Her idols will be broken to pieces. Her temple gifts burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. So you, you get this clear picture. Now, you know the shocking thing here, though? Because when you and I think of the second coming of Christ, we normally think of it as relief and peace and joy and victory, which it is. But the Jews, whenever they thought of the Lord coming near, they felt he either was coming to deliver them or he's coming to punish the evil guys. In this case, the evil guys are God's people. And the book of Micah is going to challenge you and I to say, are we people who are walking faithfully and consistently with God in faith and humble obedience to his word when it's easy and when it's not, when it costs nothing and when it costs us? Because what God did here is he started talking generally in verse 2, Hear, O peoples, plural, all nations, listen, O earth and all who are in it, because God is God of the whole earth. And the Jews at this point would all be very happy. Oh, God's coming. Oh, he's going to judge. Them. But what Amos and uh, one of the other minor prophets did, I think it was Zephaniah, they started off talking about God's coming judgment, but then they spun it around. And Micah does the same. And he says, you thinking of God coming to judge? Bear in mind, he starts with the church. 1 Peter chapter 4, you can read it in your leisure. It's time for judgment to start with the people of God. And so what happened here is Micah had to get up and say to the people who didn't want to hear it, God is coming, but he's coming to judge us. Whew. So one of the questions is, if the Lord's coming, and he's coming to judge sin, then are you and I going to be a reason that he might think about it twice, as it were. Will you look at you and I and see people who are really serious about walking in holiness and humility and obedience and faith? And say, so, okay, you know, for sake of these people, I will hold back at this time. I mean, that's how it should affect us. The second thing is, how do you respond to the news or to the, the, the presence and the news about sin all around us? How do you respond? Look at verse 8 and 9 to see how Micah responded. Because of this, he says, I will weep and wail. I'll go about barefoot naked, howl like a jackal, moan like an owl, for the wound of my people is incurable. It has come down through Samaria, as it were, to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people. Micah is shattered. Absolutely shattered. What did Jesus do when he looked at the Jews in Jerusalem? Luke 19. Jesus wept. 
He's not like a professional actor who manages to squeeze a tear down their cheek and if they really do well, they get two tears. Most of them don't. The Greek word means that he sobbed. Jesus looked at the sin of those that were being committed by the people who had the word of God and the history of the prophets and the love and the mercy and the patience of God. And they were no different. They were as corrupt as the rest. Worse, in fact. We'll see that next time. And he mourned. I mean, it's what Jesus mourned. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. See their own sin against God. They don't say, oh, well, you know, everybody sins. If you say that, you really haven't understood sin or the holiness of God. All the wrath and justice of God. Now Jesus said, blessed are those who, who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. They mourn over sin. They don't say, oh, God's going to punish those guys. I'm one of the good ones. They mourn over sin. And that's what Micah did. And what happens then is in verse 10 to 15, it's one of two laments. A lament is a poem of pain or song of sorrow. As he looks at, the, at what's going on. And the Hebrew is a grammar teacher's nightmare. There's no checking the commas in the right place. He forgets full stops. He doesn't put capitals in him places. He gets his tenses wrong. And you can't see it in English. But he, he sees the vision. And it devastates him because he lived in the area called the Shephelah, southwest of, of Jerusalem. And in his lifetime, when the Assyrians came through, there was one point where 24 towns were shattered by the Assyrians. They, these are towns that Micah as a boy would walk through. Devastated. His own hometown. Devastated. People taken off into captivity. Raped pillage, plunder. Why? Because people had turned away from God. And God says, enough, no more. You've had the opportunity to repent. You have not repented. Oh, friends, my dear brothers and sisters, are you and I serious about sin? About turning away from it? I'm not going to read the whole section. But if you read the NIV text, you'll see that there's puns and um, he plays on words and he does contrast. So he says, oh, I'll bring a conqueror against you who live in Marishal. Marishal meant conquer, conquer, conqueror. He says, well, you're going to get what you stand for. And he's not gloating. He is broken. He sees the devastation. The judgment of God is a serious thing. That's why salvation is so serious. There is a judgment to be saved from. The wrath of God is worth being delivered from. The mercies of God are great and wonderful. Let us not take them for granted. He ends his message in chapter 1. With verse 16, shave your heads in mourning for the children in whom you delight. Make yourselves as bald as the vulture, for they, your children in whom you delight, will go from you into exile. Now, it could be that they would be taken away. There were some, the Assyrians did take some away. But the big one coming is Daniel chapter 1. Jerusalem falls. 600 and something, Six, 16, 100 years on, say, from this prophecy. It's interesting that in the time of the prophet Jeremiah, when the people want to kill Jeremiah, somebody gets up, some crowd get up and say, wait a minute, Micah Morisheth, same book. He prophesied and the people didn't, didn't kill him. We need to listen to Jeremiah. You know, they, they heard and they remembered Micah, but they still were sinning. Amazing. 
They could quote the scriptures, but they didn't believe them. They didn't obey them. You and I need to be different. So what he's telling the people to do here is actually to repent. He's telling the believers, shave your heads, go into mourning now, because this is what's coming. Maybe if you repent, the Lord will spare you. So as we look at this, what do we take from it? We, we want to thank God Jesus came. We want to thank God that Jesus is coming again. We want to make sure that you and I need to be living lives that are holy, godly, God-honoring. That we are a reason to give hope to those that are without God, who are careless and lost and doomed unless they come to Christ. We need to be faithful like Micah, who preached an unpopular message and then went home and wept. He was faithful like Jesus was faithful. Last week, Sean said to us in church, uh, you know, at this point, won't you take some name, somebody you know, and pray for them, someone you can share about Jesus with. Why don't you do that today? Why don't you do that today? God wants us to have sinners on our hearts like he does. Jesus shows it. Micah mirrors it. You and I need to follow. We need to live every day ready for the return of Christ. And we need to live every day living lives that show we are serious about that great day. And offer hope to our hopeless world. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Write it on our hearts. Help us to take you seriously. We plea, help us to use your word, this great treasure, to use it well. And for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you soon. Stick with Micah. And we'll come together, God willing, and look at chapter 2 soon.